Good evening and um, welcome to Wednesday evening again. We're back in our build shop, ready for another Q&A. Um, I don't know about you, Ben, but I don't know where the last week has gone. <laughs> no. It seems like yesterday we're actually sat in here. We, we weren't sacks, we've got, we've got chairs this week, so that's a nice welcome. We have dish. upgraded and we've upgraded a microphone as well, so hopefully that works. And if it doesn't, just, just give us a shout. And yeah, a couple, of, <clears> couple <throat> of comments on what our audio is like would be greatly appreciated, mm. especially early on in the video, in case you need to make any little changes. So Yeah, definitely. Sure, far away. We've um, we've had quite a few questions coming through the week via email, of course. Don't forget in. to send a couple through in the comments section. We'll do our best to um, to answer them live on screen. Last week we had quite a few, so we struggled to get through them all. But we'll um, <laughs> we'll do our best this week. We're going to try yeah. and end it one hour slot every Wednesday. I think yeah. What, what we'll probably start doing really is um, last week we had a few. Actually, last week was quite good, but um, this week we had a few <clears throat> sort of sent in that aren't. They're good questions to a point, but not necessarily the easiest to answer. So if we don't read out your question, um, <clears throat> either we'll save it for next week or, uh, well, just think of a better question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it gets ignored uh, we've answered it before. Yeah. yeah we'll do our best. Audio yeah, um, sounds good, apparently. That's good. Happy days. Yeah. The, uh, the Argos microphone is uh, coming out <laughs> wonders. Yeah. Right, we'll start with a little question then. Um, I don't know too much about the N52 engine. We've had a question in. What would you recommend doing to improve a 2008 N52 reliability and performance at 95,000 miles? We've got reasonably high mileage and they want yeah. reliability and performance. Yeah, that's, those are two things that don't always go hand in hand. Um, obviously you've got a fair bit of engine design or sort of design within the vehicle that, um, you know, various things to make it quiet or um, emissions equipment and things like that you can get rid of that is sort of free horsepower in terms of reliability. Um, on N52s, to be honest, we haven't done a lot with them. Um, they have catalytic converters in the in the headers or the exhaust manifolds, um, depending on where you're from. Um, getting a decent set of exhaust manifolds on there does help them. Um, and I have seen some fairly wild ones in endurance one series and things like that on throttle bodies from S50s and things like that. Cans. And, they were very, very nice, um, but all, all custom. There's not really a yeah. lot on the, off the shelf for um, N52s. Um, in terms of reliability, all I've ever actually seen go wrong with them really is the Vanoff solenoids, which are just a case of popping them out the front of the head and replacing them. So, simple as that. Hopefully that answers that well enough. Yeah. Um, how long until the latest DMEs are unlocked? Who knows? A question we all want to know. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> no one seems to know the answer. Yeah. Um, we have been actually this week we've had quite a few questions about um, you know cars that people haven't even picked up yet that they're looking to um, you know tune. Um, don't know in all honesty, it's not really our forte. Um, you know we are we deal in things that are, are aluminium and iron and whatever else more than the electronic side of things. So I don't know. Um, obviously as soon as it is, uh, we'll do our best to have support for that. But at the moment. Not really yeah. our area. Yeah, not something we delve too deep into, is mm. it? No. Right, um, so we, we've got a couple pop up bench. We, my, I think my eyesight's going bad because I can't read them. I can't well. read it. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, we've had a couple of people actually. Uh, so, Steve Emerson, whose engine is actually. Uh, that one? No, that, that one. middle one. <laughs> yeah, that one. Um, so, we're building an M50 V28 for Steve. Um, which having uh, wide co pistons, SP rods, um, kind of the usual um, array of bits. Um, so it's a 2.8 crank and a, an M50 B25 block and various other bits, um, which we turbo for a track car, which would be cool. Um, <clears throat> actually, yes. we, we have had a question about that. Um, before I get onto Steve's question, we, um, we did have someone comment on a photo of that we put up in the week, our scheme horsepower expectations and, and that's something we get asked a lot mm. and we have answered this question so many times um, you know it's peak horsepower variables. numbers don't mean a lot yeah. um, really I mean it's cool to look good on the internet or whatever else but um, with Steve's car he he's not looking for a mad horsepower number no, he's not going crazy um, numbers it's it. about reliability and, and power band um, you know it's area under that curve that means a lot out on track not having a thousand horsepower at seven thousand RPM you want to make sure you've got you know say five to six hundred horsepower all the way from um halfway up the rev range something like that yeah um, 
those figures aren't for Steve's. Um, I don't think he'll be pushing that much, but um, <clears throat> I think that's a, a question that is valid, but also um, a bit meaningless. So um, next time you think about asking that, just know what our answer will be. Yeah. Uh, also, also, yeah, it just depends so much on the dyno. Um, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, you have to have the same dyno. We have all the same intake systems, the same yeah. management systems, the same exhaust systems, yeah. same tyres, same, same tyres, same transmission line, like mm -hmm. so many variables. And then you've got to have the weather, the weather's got to be the same as well, unless you've got yeah. a really nice climate controlled dyno setup. Um, yeah, we can't, we can't we should pull in numbers from thin air, really. Yeah, yeah, so um, that's that. Also, I think uh, a lot of a lot of people get caught up in the engine spec itself, and it, it's the whole package. It really yeah. is. Like, Efficiency of an exhaust manifold can make a massive difference, and actually, an inefficient manifold would mean the engine would fail a long time before one that yeah, had to set up. So, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, that's why we never answer that question properly. <laughs> <laughs> Dive out of the way. Um, should I delete the secondary air pump on my? I wish I had an Evo six LP, but um, mm. question from Beach Beach Remont Beach. Oh, I think it might be Rich oh, Roman, but sort of around or something like that. We'll read yeah. it out then. Bitch Roman. Bitch Roman. <laughs> um, should I delete the secondary air pump from my E36 Alpina B3 slash S52 based engine? Yeah. Yeah. So definitely. Um, going back to the previous question, really, that's, um, or a previous question, that, that's one of those emissions devices that, well, uh, it's just pointless. Just delete it. Um, it's way it's complication and it, it they do seem to run better without it. Yeah. Um, fundamentally, so just get rid of it. Yeah, not really any downsides to actually no. doing that. And we do have a. Gonna grab some. Of it. I meant to grab one. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, secondary air pump delete kits. Um, so yeah, have a look on the website. Um, and if you're not sure which one to buy, just drop us a message. Um, but yeah, yeah that's something we've got on the shelves. And um, yeah, not a sort of blanking plate. Nothing too much to it. A mm. bit of code and you're good to go on. Mm -hmm. um, is there one? So, you're definitely sitting closer then, so you can't read yeah. it. All I can read is something about honing. That's why I'm like, ooh. Ah, uh, honing. Um, oh, that's how. <laughs> so Alex can't read. <laughs> um, so Steve Emerson, <laughs> we kind of got sidetracked with Steve oh, Emerson's question. Yeah. Uh, has asked about engine running in, um, and then I'm really sorry, I don't know quite how to say a name iPhone, iPhone. Um, I know you've ordered bits from us, so I'm really sorry. Um, has also sort of battled up. Um, so on an M two three five I N fifty five rebuild after a spun bearing. Um, where S fifty five some pumps. That's good. Um, is it true it's bedded in within within a hundred miles? Um, that perfectly. You, yeah, it was a complete mumble, Ben. I don't understand. You didn't read the question. Oh, sorry. I was, everyone else can see it on the screen. So, uh, engine running in is a good subject. I've had my M235i N55 rebuilt after a spun bearing on a central rod recently. I had the S55 sump and pumps on as well. Is it true it's bedded in with 100 miles? Um, I think it says 100. Um, that's a perfect. Yeah. Perfect question for how we suggest running it in, really. Yeah. Um, the main thing you're doing when you're running an engine in, um, aside from perhaps cams, but I mean, that's kind of a separate topic. But the main thing you're doing is um, getting those piston rings bent yeah. into the wall. Um, we'll we'll demyth one, one myth um, bearings. Do I need to run in bearings? Bottom end wise, no, that's, that's a load of rubbish. Um, mm. They're not a contact component. You're running an oil film, a film, a film of real high pressure thin oil. There's no running in procedure for, mm -hmm. for new bearings. The only, the only sort of thing is on initial startup. Obviously, if, if you've had an assembly error um, mm -hmm. and you go flat out straight away, if it does go wrong, it's going to go wrong worse. Yeah, is the only downside. But and that would be quite heartbreaking. Heartbreaking, sorry. But that's why we work in such clinical, a clinical yeah. states. We don't really, you know, it's reducing those errors. So. Yeah, that's the thing. If you're if it's built right in the first place and running right, then there's no reason the engine can't last a very long time. Um, so our, our suggested running in, um, I, in all honesty, if someone suggests running an engine generally, that's not really what you want. Um, I wouldn't suggest redlining it every opportunity, no. anything like that. But um, actually some decent hard use, um, 
to an extent. Yeah, once you've sort of done that initial fire up, um, check mm -hmm. for obviously all leaks, check for coolant leaks, because mm -hmm. the worst thing you want to do is turn the key, think everything's good, go up the road, and you have just had everything apart. So you do want to check the underlying leaks, but mm -hmm. once, you, once you're happy with the condition of everything, then yeah, it's a nice heavy loading. Yeah, uh, and heavy sort of unloading as well. Yeah, if you can, varying it really is really yeah, helping it. If you can drive your car down a big hill in a low gear, um, get the revs right up, completely off the throttle, um, you'll have basically the highest vacuum you can have, which really sucks the ring yeah. down to the pores. Um, and it kind of works the same with you getting your foot down a little bit. Um, so I'd load it up at lower revs um, and vary the revs. The whole do laps of the M25 uh, thing. No, that's the worst, the worst thing you can do. You're just going to end up glazing your bores. Um, of course, there are variables for this as well. It really does depend on what, what, um, how critically the bores have been honed. Mm -hmm. uh, if they've been honed with like a bit of P60 sandpaper, then yeah, those rings are going to take a while to bid in. But if, if you hone the block properly to the right tolerances and and sort of get the right ore retention in your ball walls, then yeah, you shouldn't you shouldn't be taking long to to bed in. Yeah, so we use plateau honing. Um, yeah, which in all honesty is far more your department than mine. But yeah, sort of getting that um, getting your RBK numbers down, keeping your RBK numbers at like quite low, but it's, there's a lot of maths for it. Me and Wild Wars draw some pretty drawings of um, peaks and troughs and ore retention in those mm -hmm. troughs and the size of the troughs. A lot of it, you know. Obviously, we build the same engines, but if you're doing sort of high-powered diesel stuff, you're going to be varying sort of the technology and the techniques used to sort of hone the bores. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'd say the one other thing, obviously, with bedding in is if your ECU isn't mapped to the engine to have it running safely, um, then poor mapping or uh, you know mismatched mapping is going to kill an engine really quick yeah um, i think so. that's quite a valid point because a lot of people you know they've, they've had all the expense of going to have their engine done mm -hmm. and maybe they've gone for a bit of software at the same time and then they're actually in the, the the engine build is the the failure when actually the engine's been spot on it's, yeah um, it's been the management yeah of, or fueling that's actually caused it to fail over. yeah I think everyone fears engines running lean, um, and that, that isn't good for them, but um, really the, the big killer with um, any sort of either high compression or boosted petrol engine is um, detonation or running too much mm. ignition advance, it's yeah. going to kill it. Um, you know, there is no forged engine that's going to put up with, no, with that, it's, um, it will just blow up, so um, yeah, mapping is, is a big thing. Um, I'd say you, know, you want it pretty safe before you then start um, running an engine in, but I mean the ideal situation is get on a dyno, run it in, yeah. um, keep an eye on all those parameters as you're running it, um, and you can literally watch an engine bed in and start making decent numbers mm. and stop breathing quite so heavily and um, you know bring your mapping up to suit and, and really kind of get everything done in one, one sitting, which is always our recommendation. Yeah. And another thing not to forget is that nice early oil change as well. Mm. Once you've done sort of one session of, of sort of breaking in, yeah. um, nice regular oil changes to really really get that material mm. sort of from the ball walls that have been bedding in, the rings bedding in, get yeah. that material out and get some fresh oil in it. And running in oil. Yeah. Um, yeah, using using a, a suitable running in oil is um, also key. Um, if you don't get that engine bedded in um, or get those rings bedded in, um, sort of straight away really it, you yeah. could be fighting it you could be fighting yeah. getting, getting it getting a long decent long ceiling get it right. <laughs> if not yeah. forever <laughs> yeah exactly it's, it's pretty critical yeah. um, so if you are worried about it definitely don't go on just our words alone do a nice bit of reading up on it um, obviously if you get an engine done by us you get a nice little pamphlet with all that information in it mm -hmm. um, which sort of advises you on how to how to, how to fit it, how to run it in, yeah. how to get the most out of it. And usually we'll be giving you the right running in oil with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, which is yeah, fantastically helpful. Mm -hmm. um, shall we move on to another long wave question? Go so, uh, Carbonious Carbon Airbox on a Z3M with S50, bad idea for a road car. Um, and then the second part of that, alpha mapping scares me. Loss of mid range, bad idle. Um, Oh, and there's a third comment, sorry, but orgasmic sound and top end. Uh, yeah. Orgasmic uh, sound. Yeah, yeah. There, there, that's a valid point. <laughs> he, sound he, he sounds quite displeased with the car, to be honest. Um, might be happy enough to take all his hands. Yeah. Um, if that helps me at all. Keep. Yeah, I mean, drink, roasters yeah. are alright, but they're not really quite so much our cup of tea. Um, it's really difficult. S50s do have quite a. I wouldn't go as far as archaic, but a bit of a. An older, less flexible ECU setup. 
Um, so an S50 with a carbon airbox does sound amazing and it can work well. Um, I've driven one, I've got a local customer actually, he's just got a, a basically an eBay Alpha and chip. I don't know if it's making anywhere near as much power as it could or if it's particularly safe or whatever, but it does run smoothly and, and does run really well and sounds amazing. So um, it can be done, it's, it's a case of make sure you get the right map or chip or however you do it um, to suit your engine yeah. your airbox and then hopefully you'll be alright. Um, there's certainly ECU wise S54s are so much more um, flexible and, and kind of mm. do work better on the road when you start messing around with things but uh, yeah it can be done in short and should be done. Yeah um, it is a coupe if you're wondering so. Ah. I'm pretty you're yeah, lucky man. He is volunteering <laughs> to give it to us by the sound of it. Yeah. It's a smiley face. What colour right? are we talking? Yeah. I think we um in one of our recent email newsletters we uh we just quickly ran through our sort of the, the one BMW we'd have in the garage if we could. Um and I went through a number of choices because I kinda of want all of them, but uh, yeah, <laughs> Imola Red um S fifty four uh Z three M Coupe would be very nice. Um, yeah, that's the blue S50, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, it's a that nice little combo. Do. That yeah. would do. not say no to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, nice. Nice. Um, right, <laughs> back to one of our... Um, we'll stay on on track with the S50B32, shall mm. we? Um, should I look to change the rod bearings on my 120,000 mile S50B32 as preventative maintenance? And that is from LJW, IW, IW Lawrence. Um, yes, I would say in short. I think that's fair to say. Um, we have pulled S50s apart, and the bearing, you know, at, at a decent amount of mileage, and the bearings have been absolutely fine. But then we have also had plenty. We even had an engine in for a head gasket job, and it had spun a bearing, and the guy didn't know. Yeah. Um, which is obviously not a pleasant surprise. But um, if you go on YouTube, there are plenty of videos of them on track. Um, either yeah, Let's basically throwing a rod um, through the block. Uh, and it's unfortunately part of it. Um, definitely use ARP bolts as well. Really, um, if you use it on track, uh, it does seem to be a bit of a, a bit of a weak point on S50s. Mm. Yeah, well, well, well worth doing. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll definitely take that little niggle out of the back of your mind. You know, yeah. yeah, I don't yeah. run them on 10 W60 as well. Yeah, um, I think a lot of people get mixed up thinking the oil of the uh, sort of generation after of M cars is is better, and um, S50s are much happier on a. On a 1040, 540, yeah. something a little yeah. bit more normal. Um, would you get plugs, what would you get plugs to on a stage 2 M4? Also, talk spec, please. Mm. Um, generally, if it's a boot mod stage 2, um, we'll go 22,000. Mm -hmm. um, if it's something else, then speak to whoever wrote the map, really. Um, it can make them they still idle all right, but come out of a little bit lumpy um, if the, the plug gaps aren't well matched to each other as well as whatever the sort of map recommends. Um, so, yeah, have a look. Torque spec, from memory, they're 23 newton meters. Um, it actually says on the box from memory. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, um, just follow the box, you can't go wrong. They're not a crush gasket on those, they are, um, they are basically a copper washer, so you won't feel it crush like you do a lot of other spark plugs. So, if yeah. once it's down, it's down. It's not a case of them doing quarter of a turn. Yeah, quite important on them as well to have a decent plug socket because um, mm. the angle the plugs sit at at the bottom of the tube in the head. Um, if you've got something with incorrect sort of crush on the ceramic, you can end up cracking. Cracking? <laughs> you can end up cracking a plug, um, which will cause you all sorts of headaches. Yeah. Um, we've had a couple of cars in that have been so called up specialists where you can tell they've used a wrong plug spanner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. it's, it, it'll run, it'll run fine, it'll be quite a. Um, also make sure it's a yeah flexible head, yeah, um, because of that angle. And quite often, if you search for a fourteen mil double hex um, spark plug socket, it'll it'll recommend one that's about this long, which won't fit in the head because mm, of that angle. Mm -hmm. um, right, another shall we call it the triangle? The triangle reliability. Oh yeah, performance, drivability. Mm -hmm. Pick your two. Yeah, because that's all uh, you're gonna get. Um, and I think cost should come into cost, it as well. Cost sits in the middle, yeah. Because you can you can do things cheaply and they might make your power but they won't be reliable. Yeah, so. exactly. It's definitely a factor to um, yeah. take into consideration. Uh, 
Um, so Spectre and Ivy achieved 400 wheel horsepower on a NA S54. Mm. Um, 400 wheel horsepower is going to need a lot of money. A lot of money. Like. <laughs> Let's get in that corner. Um, yeah, I, again, this comes down to the dyno argument where, um, from, from what I've seen, particularly in the States, it seems there's, I think, Mustang dynos tend to read quite high. Um, and there's different tricks to making numbers look better than mm. they are. Um, I'd say, first of all, my question would be, are you sure you mean wheel horsepower? Because 400 wheel on a yeah. an S54 normally I suppose is is a is a it's yeah there. yeah. Um, I mean that would probably be um, a stroker with some really trick headwork, um, decent cams, like really decent cams. Um, lightweight everything, make sure it can rev a yeah, lot. Yeah, um, the mess down bottom end. Mm, um, um, which of course, once you've done all that, you're you're going to lose your reliability. That's exactly it. You um, as soon as you push into that, you, you then you you can push for one and you start losing the other. Um, so you're gonna have a lot of cost and power, but you can start losing reliability. Um, and you're gonna be want, want to, wanting to run on decent fuel as well. So. Yeah, you're probably gonna really want to bump compression up. Um, I, it's it's probably doable. Yeah. Um, but well, yeah, after you've done that, I'm not sure I'd then want to just take it down to. Tesco no. as my reliable. No, that driver. is going to be a very expensive, weapon. yeah, very sort of optimised um, race engine. Uh, I'd say 400 horsepower at the flywheel. Yeah. Um, relatively achievable, certainly not as easily as, uh, again, a lot of dyno figures will have you believe. Um, but, yeah, it, it can be done. Um, you're going to need cams, you're going to want to up compression. Um, a general go through of everything really. Yeah. Um, probably a lot of bit poor work on the exhaust side. Um, decent airbox, decent exhaust. Again, that's we'll get asked how much power an engine will make, and it, there's so much more to it. Um, yeah, all sorts. You're really, really going to be pushing things quite hard at that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. But if you do want to build, and you have got an endless wallet, get in contact. <laughs> yeah. and we'll, um, we'll get you something sorted. Yeah. Uh, single or dual mass flywheel for the. There's a lot of S50 questions. So mm. A lot of E36 love. Uh, yeah. Place. Oh, no. oh, um, not why. Single or dual mass flywheel for the S50B32 Euro. Uh, again, this is another one that uh, depends what you use it for. Um, if it's a track car, then yep, definitely single mass. You can lose quite a bit of weight, um, and you know that'll help you flipping those revs up on down changes, um, general acceleration. Um, mm. But for the road, uh, they can make a little bit of noise, um, depending on the setup. Uh, and yeah, they're not, not always necessarily what you want. Um, they are certainly drivable on the road, but yeah. if you're looking for a, an OEM, you know, really lovely road car, then I'd probably stick to your mess in all honesty. Mm. Yeah, wise words. Mm. Um, right, we've got a question from a man called Neil. Uh, Nislock92. Uh, hi, great Beamer and tuning content. Over in Ireland, so E36 isn't good, E46s are getting hard to find now. Mm -hmm. Can I ask on the most recent post, when you measure your volumes and calculate your compression ratio, what do you then do with this info? What makes it so important to know your values here? Thanks, Neil. Um, it's, it's basically, you don't want to be relying on what piston manufacturers are actually telling you, um, so it's, it's a case of just doing a load of maps, measuring your, your volume of your piston when it's actually fitted to the engine where it's sitting in relation to the, the top of the deck on the block. Um, you're also measuring obviously your chamber volume, um, the volume that the head gasket is taking up and adding all those components together until you've actually got sort of something that you can then work from, um, whether that means then taking the dry build apart and heading back into the machine shop to sort of take a bit of material off the, the head face to up that compression ratio in the head mm. or you know doing a bit of work to the piston crowns or doing a bit of deck a bit, a bit of dicking yeah. <laughs> um, on the block to, to sort of up those values or or lower those values it's um yeah it's a pretty critical part of engine building. Mm. Yeah very much so. I think a lot of part a, a lot of that uh, then comes down to A power goals but B what it's being used for. I mean a turbo builder have lower compression, but you don't just want to lose all compression. You, yeah. You, you know, if you had a 
if you're running seven to one on a on a turbo engine, you'd probably really struggle for droppability. Um, it would just have no grunt until it really comes on boost. Whereas if you ran ten to one, um, you could make the same peak power but far better. Um, yeah. You know, power curve um, and much better drivability. So it's it's to do with what you use it for, but also um, power goal, uh, what fuel you're using. Um, if you try to run too much compression and too much boost to make a certain power level, um, then you will suck with destination. Um, unless you're yeah, I mean, I occasionally get asked, oh, can you just take two mil off, off my head? Mm -hmm. I want to up my CR, and it's well, you know, do you know what you're up in it to? Have you got, you know, what you, you know, if we take a load of meat off your head and then you're running like. 13 and a half to one on your, on your, not even Supreme on leaded, just your yeah. cheapo Tesco petrol. Everything's gonna just detonate and blow up. Yeah, I think I think Chris is talking about a friend of his. He had a the Peugeot 106. He skinned yeah. a mil and a half off the head or something. <laughs> yeah, and didn't, you know, then didn't change any fueling, ignition timing, nothing. Just yeah, exactly. Steady, steady, and it apparently was rapid, uh, but not very long. And sure enough. Um, whatever it did, it, it combusted itself quite badly. Um, so yeah, there's, there's many variables. It's also forgotten as well, I think, um, while we're on the topic, a lot of um, people turboing their engines will just run a really thick head gasket to drop the compression. Yeah, hideous, now see hideous. <laughs> um, um, there's a, I do I have a piston somewhere? Um, I'm sure I do. <laughs> There's a squish band around the outside of the yeah. piston. Um, Quite a critical component of design, I'd say. Oh, Chris is watching, thinking you just sent my gudgeon clean clip along the floor. Yeah. Oh, we'll be having words in the morning, Ben. Yeah. So if I hold this up a bit closer, you've got this this part around the uh, outside of the piston, and that's your squish band. And you'll find that the head's probably got a similar kind of uh, area to it. And what that does is. Um, it, it pushes that compression, compression, and, and sort of the, the center of your combustion, um, really pushes it to the middle yeah. of your piston, which is really efficient. Um, if you then run a really thick head gasket, you open up that squish, and you lose the effect, and it's really inefficient and bad for your engine. So, yeah, I um, hate really thick head gaskets. Yeah. Um, so that's why you measure it all, um, basically, so you can make machine adaptations mm -hmm. to actually increase it rather than just. Throwing a big old head gasket in it, or just relying on the on the spec sheets that come with your piston. Um, what's to say if you bought a set of nine to one compression pistons for your turbo build, um, that your head hasn't had a load shaved off it, or your deck mm -hmm. hasn't been taken down by a, a large amount? So it's, it's basically just, I like the term blueprinting, um, sort of measuring everything up, getting all your facts mm -hmm. before you actually then build your engine. Yeah, and what you're quite often find as well, if you've got a good mapper, you can show them that, and they'll. Yeah, they'll know how to treat it to yeah, get the exactly. best from it, and it'll help them understand the results they see from mapping changes, mm -hmm. which is hugely important to make the most out of it. So. Oh, it's all over there. <laughs> I was going to, I was going to show the burette, but ah, um, yeah, that's okay. Really. Um, yeah, and then of course measuring it, um, you really want to be nice and accurate. So getting some decent measuring apparatus like a, a burette, you know, when you can measure it down to sort of tenth of a, a milliliter. Um, everything's going to help, especially mm -hmm. when you sort of pull in one reading from there, your piston crown volume, your head volume, you've got quite a few different measurements, um, so actually being accurate yeah. in every stage of the process is going to help. And say on, well, on any part of CCing, you'll be using a probably a clear plate perspex or something like that, um, even measuring the volume that the, the hole that you're filling it through um, mm. and making sure you take that into account uh, with your measurement because generally you'll fill to the top of that plate so you've got that tiny little extra bit. Um, it, it's all important to be accurate. Um, it's Accuracy is key with engine building in every single part. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's that one. Is that a little question I see coming there? Uh, it really is know? not. No. <laughs> uh, so Matt, um, MRF Automotive, who is a relatively local customer, um, he's got an E36 M3 and he just said, Single mass flywheel is a great upgrade when combined with the 34 M5 clutch. Perfectly usable and quiet. Um, so yeah, uh, pretty much. I think part of that is um, if you're using a solid flywheel, solid single mass, make sure the clutch disc is a sprung um, disc 
mm. not a solid one because uh, solid will make a lot of noise and really transmit a lot of vibration through the gearbox so ethos 4 and 5 clutch is a good one um, and it's also perfect because it's easy to get yeah um, and cheap so yeah that's a very valid point um, at what temperature are factory measurements taken generally 20 degrees is what you sort of want to aim for um, that's not you know that's generally a measuring standard uh, if you can aim for for 20 degrees that should whatever you're measuring that's sort of where you want to be at yeah rule of thumb yeah um, yeah so this this room is set of course in June 1989 <laughs> in the great Bavarian frost when BMW struggled to get the temperature above minus nine. Really? In fact, yeah, <laughs> everything was very small. Uh, yeah. We should do a lot of clearances and a, everything. A fun made up facts with yeah. the Alex Lester section. Yeah, um, don't take that there. Yeah. I, I don't know, um, I wasn't around in 1989. It was a barrier to, to no. see the temperature. But, uh, yeah, so, that's generally what you're yeah, aiming for. And th this room is kept at, at 20 degrees and yeah. also kept dehumidified. So. But, um, um, so it's just dropped a little bit. We've had to turn the heater off to stop the audio. Yeah, that's it. And then keeping humidity going in here is obviously pretty key as well, mm -hmm. keeping all the components we've got in um, tip top shape. As much as everyone else at Hack Engineering despises Chris in his nice 20, 20 yeah. degree cocoon when it's like 4 degrees in the workshop, but yeah. um, it's, what we, it's what we're sort of aiming for is keeping, mm -hmm. keeping our temperatures so we can keep reliability. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there was a. Oh, there was. I think there was a question that's been retracted. Oh, no, no. Uh, uh, we've got a question from Edward Schloss. Schloss? Schloss? Schloss. Uh, my R53 Cooper has burnt out an exhaust valve. Uh, do I need to lap in the new valve? Or valves? Uh, this is a good one. This is I see these a lot. Machine shop yeah. uh, area. But um, yeah, we've picked up quite a few and people have a similar question. Um, and you need to be looking at the cause of yeah, happen, yeah. It? There's probably the main. Well, on that particular engine, the main reason that will have burnt out a valve is probably excessive guide wear. Pretty common. Um, so you've got a bronze, fossil bronze guide running in there that just wears out, um, causing sort of the valve to start running pretty eccentrically in um, up against the seat, then causing sort of blow by on that valve, which then obviously gets worse and worse and slowly starts to burn away. Um, got a couple of nice little examples here actually. Um, yeah, it isn't. So that's a pretty extreme sort of example. As we can see, there's our valve with a nice little slot right out of it. So that's sort of worst case. That's what can happen. Um, except, of course, in that situation, it was actually caught quite early. Um, you could find you could actually lose the top of the, the head of the valve and cause far worse damage. Um, which could then result in, in anything from the end of the valve maybe dropping off. And then you've got a nice 10p piece rattling around in the top of your engine, grenading everything in its wake. Mm. But yeah, that's definitely what I'd recommend there, Ben, is um, have a look at the guides. Yeah. Um, of course, not something you can really replace in your garage at home to get the head down to no. us. And we're, we've seen um, people try. We've seen people try. Oh, yeah, I remember a customer saying that the, uh, the thread at the top of the guide wasn't right and pulling it out. Yeah. It's not a thread. Um, serrated. Yeah, machine that's still um, in the valve stem still. Yeah, um, which is obviously a worrying thing to hear. Um, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, really, uh, you'll probably find. I imagine you probably find videos on YouTube. I've never really looked, but um, in theory, you could heat up the head and maybe hammer them out. Um, yeah, a lot of machine shops do sort of mm. drift them out. Um, it sort of works, but you can end up picking up the material from the head on the guide, causing a bit of damage to the actual bore. And if you are going to do that, make a tool for it as well. Which yeah, you, you, want to you want to turn a nice tool up on a laser. It's, it's not a thing you really want to do. And plus, if you're doing it at home with a, with a hammer or a sledgehammer, or you're jumping on it, it's going to um, it's not going to go in straight, and then you're going to have terrible valve to um, to seat concentricity. So it's just not going to seat nicely. Um, I mean, you could lap it in, but I, I reckon if you put there for a while, if you put a bad guide in, you'd probably be lapping for a good couple of years before you finally got a decent <laughs> seat. So I'd far more recommend bring the head down here, and we'll, we'll, you know, going back to temperature early. Obviously, machine various different components. You've got an aluminium head with a bronze guide. Um, there's different interference fits. So we'll heat each part up, heat the head, cool the guide right down to sort of negative temperatures to really reduce that interference fit on initial mm. sort of. Um, fitting so then when it's up to running temperature you've got your correct interferences yeah and if, if you have a well fitted seat it's 
it is so much more central. Yeah, it, yeah. it goes in without then having to recut a seat really deeply or something like that. Yeah, you can then just get away with a nice little light cut to um, get everything running in the same the same axis. Mm -hmm. And on yeah, on that topic as a separate thing without guides, if you're looking at lapping your valves unless you know what you're looking for from lapping that in, um, you know, blowing it up, really checking properly. Um, or if it's in a bad state, full stop. Um, yeah, lapping is only going to get you so far. You know, that's yeah, a you need a decent technique. cut on the seat and, and you know a, a good condition valve, um, all of which we can refurb here. Um, so yeah, if, if you're not sure or if anything is in a bit of a state, you think you might be there lapping for a, a few months, then um, yeah, just bring it down here and we'll sort it. Uh, it's, uh, it pays to have the right equipment. Yeah, exactly. You know, we, we put a lot of money into the company getting the right tool in so we can carry out the jobs mm. correctly. Um, you can't do everything in your yeah. garage at home as much as I used to try. And <laughs> it never ended well. Yeah. Um, what we will say is we're almost out of questions here, so please do keep commenting and get some more in. There's oh, one come in. Here we go. Really don't have to be too car related, engine related. You know, I like ice cream if we want to talk about ice cream. Yeah. So get those I'll questions. I'll tell you what in. we could talk about. Uh, so, Truffles Bakery. Um, oh, wow. They're a local Sussex bakery. They uh, they do a special donut every Friday. Donut of the day. Donut well, of the week, really. I suppose it is of the week, yeah. I think. Uh, yeah, so um, it's if time you want of the week to see reviews, reviews then, then let us know. We've got a gold bar donut this week. Yeah, we've, uh, we've put a pre order in, so we've got quite a large shipment of yeah. 16 gold bar donuts. <laughs> yeah. um, all sorts of varieties. Keep the workshop. Apple happy. crumble next week. Uh, um, I think it's toffee apple crumble. Toffee apple crumble. Mm. Um, but the Valentines didn't rate that too much. Um, crunchy, that's coming. The up. crunchy, yeah. And if Truffles the King Bakery, of Bueno Donut, yeah, where, that do, is where do we stop? And oh wow, if Truffles Bakery would ever like to sponsor our live sessions, yeah, <laughs> do get in touch. I think I'd be um, more excited about a sponsorship from a bakery than yeah than anyone else to be yeah. honest. <laughs> Bake goods make the world go round. Um, oh, let's jump to Jen's question. Uh, have you decided on a name for the new crown grinder? Um, so Jen actually works here. Um, Jen set up this very she did. studio that we are working on, mm -hmm. working in right mm -hmm. now. Um, no, we haven't. We've had a couple of suggestions. I think oh, we I was should... looking earlier again. I think Crankenstein's my favourite. Crankenstein, Cranky McCrank face, but it's going to be really long along the front. So I, I tell you what, we'll name it. Tonight on the show, I want comments of the crank grinder name. We'll go through. Yeah. We'll pick the best one. As a bit of background to anyone who doesn't know as well, yes. it's a seven and a half ton Russian crank grinder. Um, um, so obviously Russian themed, crank themed, machinery themed. Um, use, use your you know creative power and uh, let us know what you think. Because there's nothing better to do on a Wednesday night than name, name. a man's <laughs> big grinder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right back to the more engine related questions um uh, you did tell us how to say your name and i missed it and it got retracted um a fun i fun sorry uh quick question it, yeah <laughs> what's the best engine oil for a turbo petrol for a liability on track r and cash 5w30 and my m235i change it every track day um uh, it depends on a lot more than whether it's turbo or not. Um, yeah, all sorts really. I, I'd say that sounds like a pretty good choice. Um, it's also worth having a look at um, not only grades but uh, what additives are in that oil, um, mm -hmm. what you know formula and makeup it is. Because it's not just about semi-synthetic, synthetic stuff like that. You know, pretty much everything runs synthetic these days. Um, it's, it's about how that oil is, is built up. Um, so you'll get um, quite a lot of high performance oils or a high ester content, which is um, you know a synthetic sort of build up, uh, which is really good for protecting engine components, but it doesn't last as long. Um, so cash or edge, um, stuff like that, or you know the millers that we, we really mm. like is a high ester content. If you're looking for a, a road car that you want to stretch out those oil changes, um, hopefully you don't because that's just not good. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you're looking for, for some of the stretch out oil change interval, intervals of, then you're probably looking for a, a less um, ester based content oil. Um, mm -hmm. It also then comes down to uh, how that engine's been built up, um, clearances of components. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, there's unfortunately all sorts to it. Um, in the sort of N55, S55, N54 stuff, we'll generally run a Miller's Nano Drive 5W40, which um, certainly seems to work. Yeah, very well. So well. Yeah. Um, so another what, question. What crank grinders names have we got so far then? Crank Sinatra. Come on, that oh, one. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. And um, Vladimir Cranking. Vladimir Cranking. Yeah. I do like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'll keep them coming. It would have to um, be our company policy. I have to sing every crank that we grind. Mm. I like it. Grinding in the rain. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what a glorious feeling I'm grinding again. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, speaking of Russia and countries, um, do let us know where you're watching from because it'd be quite interesting to see. Yeah. Uh, obviously, obviously we're in the UK, but uh, if there's anyone watching outside the UK or in the extremities of the UK or around Europe, whatever, um, let us know because we'd love to know where people are watching from. Um, right, another question. Ryan McCulley. Uh, S54 engine, 63,000 miles, serviced every 5,000 miles with TWS 1060 oil. Uh, advice on getting the rod bearings changed. Um, I would always say if you haven't owned a car from new and known exactly mm -hmm. how it's been treated, um, I'd consider getting them changed. It, it's just one careless owner who mm -hmm. just turns that key and buries their foot. Yeah, you know, yeah, we well, yeah. wouldn't have to do that many times to, to really do the damage. And once the damage is done, it only accelerates future damage. And it's, yeah, you can't, it's, it's you can't get away from that. It. Really, yeah. it? uh, as soon as it starts going, it's just going to get worse and worse. Um, we had a Z4M in um, a while back that was on, oh, I think, 36,000 miles. Um, we've referenced it a few times um, because it is one of the lowest mileage S54s we've worked on, and actually, one that Needed. It probably did well, change our mind a little, didn't it? Yeah. It's not a nice low mileage, but as you say, if you, if you don't know that history, yeah, um, the the customer was extremely and meticulous and, and really wanted them changed. And I actually advised against it on that mm. on on that um, occasion and, and said, you know, it's too soon. Maybe look at doing it, even at fifty thousand miles, you know, quite early. Um, but the car was an ex demonstrator at BMW and had quite clearly been rags from cold um, mm. and the bearings were in quite a state yeah. right down to the copper yeah that's it um, and you know that's on a 2007 car with sub 40,000 miles by quite a way so yeah difficult to say really um, I would say as well that Castrol that they are recommended to be run on going back to what we said about oils just now if that is stretched out to the full um, you know condition based servicing kind of service scheduling um, which can be sort of 14 15,000 miles that is not going to be good for it at all um, yeah yeah that's where a lot of their failures come from really is that mm. is that interval um, choice of the oil and the interval which it's recommended yeah, to be changed out completely just, unsuitable yeah it gums up the entire engine which only mm. causes you know it's already got design flaws the poor thing <laughs> you know give it a bit of a chance to then then restrict restrict certain parts of the engine with even less oil mm. um, it's definitely definitely not a wise thing so. yeah Regular servicing is my one big thing. Yeah, yes, that, that is the one thing that will, it's a combination of everything, but that is a huge factor. So if it's been done every uh, 5,000 miles from you, I wouldn't expect to see much wear on them, but you really just can't take it for granted. Um, mm -hmm. It is, it's not a mileage related um, sort of wear element to that. Yeah. So, um, one to think about, I'm from you. Oh. Nice. Well, that sounds very lovely. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, I would say it's so probably, probably right early. <laughs> yeah. if, um, if you can hand on heart say you've looked after it, um, you've always let it warm up, and you've been a uh, a responsible custodian mm. to that motor vehicle, then um, you should be okay for a while. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, because that's a, that is a rarity to actually yeah. have one on low mileage that's been owned by the same owner from new mm. is um yeah not something we hear too much about quite. Quite like to see some photos of that car if you wouldn't mind sending them through. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I'd say probably 80, 90,000 miles. Yeah, my general definitely stuff in there. Um, yeah. In all honesty, as we said, you may pull them out and find that they're really not good or they yeah. might be fine. Yeah, it's the un unfortunate sort of um, yeah. the side of that job, and until you until you take them out, you don't know, but by the time you take them out, you might as well replace them. Mm. It's not exactly a 
five minute job just to pop them out and have a little look and go, oh no, they'll go again. <laughs> Um, uh, another sort of factor to the, the 46M3 bearing issue is recalls. Um, quite often, probably the thing, if, if we're on opposite ends of the workshop, the thing that we'll call each other over for most of all is seeing how dealerships have mucked up a recall job so badly. Would you call it shoddy? Shoddy. Shoddy. Would be more exact term. Exactly. Um, we'll quite often find really excessive silicon around the sump gasket. Um, you've got the sort of main oil pickup at the back of the oh, sump, yeah. which has a strainer around That's it. That's a particular favourite. Just a oh, it's it's, it's catchy yeah. on something. Have you got a there. you've got a transmission jack? Or <laughs> I can just jack the sump back onto yeah. the engine. Yeah, and we've we've actually seen the wear that pickup, so it should sit within the strainer. I've just seen it where it's, it's, it's folded it all in around in the there. side of it. And, um, yeah, shoddy and yeah, really just appalling. Uh, also, another note, uh, we discussed it last week. Um, the pattern we see is that actually the earlier M11 rod bulb cars, so sort of two, early 2003 and previous, seem to be better on bearings than the mm -hmm. later ones, um, which are a stretch bolt. So take from that what you will. Um, but yeah, there's so many factors to think about, but um, don't think that because it's been recalled. But <laughs> the Diary of Anne. <laughs> nice. I like it. Yeah. That's the book I'm going to write about crank grinding. Yeah? yeah. The Diary of Anne Crank. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, Favourite car that has been in the garage from RC Madness with Tate, who was here today. Um, oh, Tatey boy. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, it's actually something we were discussing earlier. I mean, favourite car that's ever been in the garage, or favourite car that's in at the moment? Um, so with the moment, yeah, let's go at the moment. Um, I can't even remember what's out in the garage. Then <laughs> I've set six cars outside at the moment. Yeah, um, let's start. We got we got Ian's, of course, long termer. We're still waiting on parts for. Um, his <laughs> yeah. E28 M535i, very nice example. Yes, I do like that car. Underneath that, we've got Dave's E30. Six. Uh, E30. <laughs> E36. You know, fully caged, <laughs> mega bit of kit. Yeah. Uh, behind that, what we've got Gareth's Gareth's M4. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a you know six hundred plus a monstrous horsepower. horsepower. Yeah, beast. Yeah. Uh, behind that, we've got quite a nice E36 E4. 